Good morning. Buenos dias. My name is Gina Aguirre Adams, President and CEO of the Brazoria County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I want to welcome everyone to this virtual healthcare roundtable focus on cancer awareness. I want to, um, our business development committee decided uh, this would be a great time for us to be able to talk about the preventatives of cancer. First, I would like to thank um, this, this event would not be possible without our sponsors, the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, UTMB Health and Community Health Network. Last, I would like to introduce to you um, Amber Newman, which is our moderator for today. She is um, the vice chair of the Brazoria County Hispanic Chamber Board and also the president CEO of the Boys and Girls Club. Thank you, Amber, for joining us today and, and moderating this event. Thanks, Gina, for having me. And thank you to all the panelists for attending on today. Um, we are super excited to get some information from you guys and what you guys have to share. So we have a number of attendees ready to listen. So first off, I would like um, each of the panelists to take two to three minutes to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and your practice. And we'll start off with Dr. Chang. Great, well, thanks very much, Amber and Gina. It's really a pleasure for me to be here and thanks for putting this event together. Uh, my name's George Chang and um, I'm a colorectal surgical oncologist at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. I'm, a, I'm actually the chair of the Department of Colon Rectal Surgery and um, you know, we've, uh, where our, our work is entirely focused on the treatment of patients with uh, colon and rectal cancer. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I look forward to a great discussion. Awesome, thanks Dr. Chang. Next, we have Dr. Poindexter. Hi, um, good morning everyone. My name is Dr. Yvette Poindexter and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Community Health Network. Community Health Network is a federally qualified health center um, originally uh, located or started in inception in Brazoria County, uh, but we also have branches um, in the Galveston County area as well as Southeast Houston area as well. Um, I am a OB-GYN uh, by specialty and have been practicing women's health uh, since 1997. Um, looking forward to working with everyone to, today as I'm a, a Texas native and um, trained in the medical center back in the day as well and, and a graduate of UTMB. So I got all my people around me, that's wonderful. Um, women's health is very dear to me. Uh, the wholeness of a patient is important and uh, prevention is where we need to start, especially um, with colorectal cancer. Thank you so much, Dr. Poindexter. And last but not least, we have Dr. Humphrey. I'm a general surgeon at the UTMB Angleton Danbury campus. I'm also the associate CMO uh, of our campus here in Angleton and the uh, uh, chairman of the department, of, uh, chairman of the, uh, or chief of surgery here in Angleton. It's very nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Humphrey. I just love how you just came out of nowhere. It's like a, a superhero, which all of you doctors are. So I'm super excited to have you all here today. We're having technical duty or technical difficulties next door. So <laughs> no worries. All righty, so we'll, we'll just get started. What, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask um, a series of questions and so there'll be specific. I think you all have received those questions. So it's, it's no surprises. Um, so I will start off in, in the order of kind of um, how you, I see you guys. And so I'll start off with Dr. Chang. Um, the first question is, how common is colorectal cancer and what is colorectal cancer? Well, it's, um, it's, great. It's, um, it's great that this is being highlighted, particularly on the last day of March, which is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. 
Colorectal cancer is um, a cancer that grows in our large intestine. So as we know, you know, we have in our GI tract, um, we have our stomach, we have our small intestines, we have then the large intestine, the first part being the colon and the last part being the rectum. Colorectal cancer is extremely common. In fact, it's the third most common cancer uh, in the United States um, among men and women. Um, it's, an, it's, an increasingly, um, it's an increasingly important problem in, in young adults today. In fact, I think many people have heard um, about the dramatic rises in the incident, the rise in the incidence of colorectal cancer in young adults. And particularly in young adults, it's a cancer that tends to affect more of the, the latter part of that large intestine, which so kind of the, the uh, latter part of the colon and more of the rectum than it does in older adults. Um, and in fact, um, you asked how common it is, you know, um, about, one, um, about one in 25 people in the United States actually will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer in their lifetime. So if you sit around a room, we're not, you know, in our COVID times, we're not really sitting around rooms with lots of people anymore, but if you're in a virtual room like this and there's 25 other people, one person will, be, uh, will eventually be diagnosed with colorectal cancer sometime in their lifetime. So really, really important problem, uh, very common cancer, but another kind of really great news about it um, is that um, while it is a common cancer, it's a very curable cancer. So we have a ton of colorectal cancer survivors in the United States, probably about a million and a half people who have who are alive today having, um, you know, as survivors of, of colorectal cancer. So that's really great news, which is why this discussion is so um, apropos. You are absolutely right. Okay, second question for Dr. Humphrey. How can we educate our minority communities on the importance of cancer prevention? Uh, I, th I think, uh, you know, it, it's going to take, um, you know, multiple uh, ways to address this. One is um, community uh, organizations such as this and, and having um, physicians such as ourselves being invited so that we can discuss this with um, people within the community uh, to spread awareness. Um, also is, um, I think, uh, increasing conversation with the primary care physician um, to the patient in discussing the role of screening tests. Um, there are various screening tests for uh, colon cancer, but just starting that conversation and uh, making the patient aware that this is uh, something that we can screen for and um, with early detection, uh, very treatable or even potentially uh, preventable, especially with colonoscopies when we can um, address the findings on those uh, screening uh, colonoscopies. So um, those are a couple of ways where we can Im improve um, uh, getting the word out to our patients. Sounds good. Um, and so Dr. Poindexter, what is the percent of Hispanic men and women that have colorectal cancer? So it's interesting you asked the OBGYN that question, right? <laughs> We might, we might, I, you know, as we go around the round table, we may have to ask um, some of the expertise to experts in the room. Um, but you know, the um, as they were as they were discussing, you know, the the third uh, cause of cancer is colorectal cancer, and um, it is important to look at the disparities amongst amongst groups. And so there's less than um, I believe like less than 4%, and you all correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, uh, about the, the Hispanic colorectal cancer diagnoses. Um, so even though it may be a small percentage, it's actually one of the higher cancer rates in, in Hispanic minorities. Uh, there are also you know, other disparities that I, I think that we should also talk about as well because it's it's not only it's affecting minorities, period. And I want to go back to the the question that Dr. Humphrey addressed as as well because 
you know, screening is important, um, but what people don't realize is that they're not always, they, they feel they don't have choices to get screened. And um, so when we get to, you know, outreach and, and uh, places as far as screening goes, because one of the social determinants for, for these different things is that, you know, the, the finances, um, the education, those are all social determinants that affect persons and uh, we, you know, it goes further than just getting these education and, and getting us um, uh, at the round table. It goes to affordable health care. So there's a lot we can, you know, talk about why these disparities do exist today. Thank Amber, you. You're absolutely I, right. Mm -hmm. Amber, if I may make a comment, um, sure. Dr. Poindexter is absolutely right. Um, in fact, I, I believe it's the second most common cancer diagnosis among Hispanics. So people mm -hmm. of color are definitely affected. Um, among African-Americans, we are we identify colorectal cancer at a younger age um, than, than, um, than non-Blacks, as an example. Um, it, it doesn't matter what your race is, and it, um, it is a common cancer, whether it's the second most common or the third most common diagnosis, it's extremely common. And, um, and uh, you know, this kind of effort is, is super important. The other reason this kind of effort is important, I think you were addressing this earlier, is um, it is a preventable cancer. And in fact, it's one of the few preventable cancers that exist. You know, we talk about many cancers as being cancers where we wanna make the diagnosis as early as possible. So breast cancer is a great example. You know, we, we obtain mammograms so that um, we can identify breast cancer at the earliest stage. But the mammogram can actually, doing, um, doing mammography or breast cancer screening does, doesn't actually afford an opportunity to prevent cancer from developing. In the situation of colorectal cancer, whether you're Hispanic or um, any other race, um, the test, the different tests that we utilize, particularly colonoscopy, actually affords an opportunity to identify a precursor lesion, meaning a growth in our large intestine before it ever can become a cancer, right? That what I'm talking about are polyps, right? So the way cancers develop is, colorectal cancers typically develop, is that first we have an overgrowth of, um, the, of some of the, the cells that we have in the lining of our large intestine. That turns into what many people I think have heard about called polyps. Polyps themselves are not cancers. And polyps themselves are exactly what we wanna identify because if we can identify the cancer on colonoscopy, then we can remove it. And by removing it, we actually can prevent cancer from occurring. So while I mentioned earlier that we have a rising incidence of colorectal cancer among young adults today, it's actually declining in people who are over the age of 50. And the reason it's declining, which is great news, and the reason it's declining, it's really an indicator of the success of the efforts at prevention and screening. So it's because people are getting colonoscopies and are able to then um, identify these lesions and prevent them from ever occurring. The problem we have today, and um, the problem we have today is that we're not getting enough colonoscopy. So we're not doing enough screening. And um, you know, that's especially true, unfortunately, in, um, in you know, groups of color in particular, because there is this um, stigma or you know, a variety of different factors, right? And access is a huge um, issue as well kind of keep people from going to get their screening test. First, you gotta see a doctor. Um, so, and your doctor has to recommend it. And then you have to be able to take time off from work to go get the test done. And you know, you also, there are out-of-pocket expenses. The, and then um, the whole concept of the, you know, the clean out and, and a lot of diff, you know, there are a lot of cultural barriers to, you know, things that have to do with poop, you know, as an example. And so, and it's, you know, it's, um, you know, many people find it a little bit unpleasant um, as well, but it's certainly a lot less unpleasant than getting colorectal cancer. Yeah. And so um, I think, you know, these are, these are factors um, that affect, um, you know, uh, our, affect kind of our community levels of sort of, you know, prevention. But um, things we, you know, if we can take advantage of anything that we can do like this kind of an event or um, any other community groups um, that are help that are able to kind of help get the word out and encourage people. Um, I think you know that's a great way to you know make a make a better debt. 
probably yep. about 60% of the people who should be screened are actually getting screened today. And so um, we need to get that number up higher. Yep, I think you're absolutely right, Dr. Chang. You hit the nail right uh, on the head when you, you know, with the comments that you were making. Um, you know, you you guys are so good that you have answered my question number two about um, how colon cancer can be detected, and you said that through a colonoscopy, and then. Um, who should be tested for that? You talked about that too, but let me ask you this, and this is not a question on there. I, I know personally for myself, um, normally they say to get a colonoscopy when you're about 40 years old. Um, do you guys um, see that changing, that trend changing to say now we should be a little bit younger um, in going to have that done since you're saying that now the 50 year olds, uh, they're not seeing as much as declining because I think they're taking that step at 40. But what do you guys think at maybe getting it a little bit earlier than 40? Traditionally, colon cancer screening uh, was recommended starting at age 50. And that, that number has changed now. Um, several societies, including the American College of Surgeons and the American Society of Gastroenterology have moved that screening up to 45. And so now um, what I'm seeing more with um, patients coming in to see me at 45 years old for screening, it, initially the insurance companies were not wanting to cover these as screening tests, but we're seeing more and more acceptance uh, in getting these screening tests done. Um, I think colon cancer, um, had the incidence of it has, um, and I don't know if this is related to our diet or sedentary lifestyle, but colon cancers are, seem to be developing a little bit earlier than what we initially thought. And so moving that screening um, guideline to 45, um, again, as uh, Dr. Chang noted, really um, helps us be able to determine either early diagnosis or earlier diagnosis of colon cancer, making it an even more treatable disease versus just going ahead and uh, being able to remove those precancerous polyps so that it prevents a patient from developing colon cancer. And then certainly based on patient's family history, uh, f findings at colonoscopy will determine the interval of um, when we're gonna uh, go ahead and have our next colonoscopy. And, and to address Dr. Chang's, uh, what he also had stated earlier regarding access to these procedures, there are many other types of screening tests. Colonoscopy is considered the gold standard screening test because it not only is a diagnostic study, but it also allows us to provide an intervention for the patient at the time. There are other tests and I, I, I'll have patients that come to my office that for whatever reason are adamant about not undergoing colonoscopy, but there are other, other tests that we can offer patients um, that um, of course they're not quite as good as a colonoscopy, but at least um, we're able to start the dialogue with the patient and uh, get things rolling for their colon cancer screening. And you mentioned okay. about family history. Um, in family history, if there is a family history, uh, you recommend to get it before 45 if there is a, a family history in um, some cases? So if you have a first degree relative, such as uh, you know your mother, father, brother, sister with colon cancer, and if they were um, diagnosed with colon cancer, then you would wanna start your screening 10 years beforehand or at the age of 40 years old. Okay. All righty, you guys are awesome. I mean, you are answering these questions like pros. I, I know you all went to medical school, so that 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 <laughs> is the answer I see. <laughs> so I, I'd like to touch um, on what Dr. Humphrey said. I think you know the conversation that we're having. This is this is what a roundtable is. You know where we 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 understand uh, what 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 just mentioned. You know as far as the colonoscopy and the option of other testing. Um, that are available, that's important when we go back to social determinants of health because colonoscopy, there are challenges and barriers there uh, that, they, that persons may not be able to, they might not have insurance, um, there might be a high deductible. So those are the other options that may be available to take home such as a, a fit card, um, you know, but Again, that's not that prevention where you can actually visualize through a colonoscopy and, and remove a polyp if, if there is something actually there. But we can at least start that dialogue. Um, the other, other is, is that there are some things that we can change. Uh, we can help educate persons to get to that point. That dialogue also includes 
you know, your behaviors. There are some things that we as persons can, um, you know, it might be a family history uh, as mentioned, but it also may be the sedentary lifestyle, not, not being physical, uh, especially in these times of COVID. Um, their alcohol intake has been alcohol intake or uh, possibly um, smoking. You know, a lot of things have been linked back to, to cancer. And so there are other ways that we can, we can start that dialogue for prevention of, um, of a lot of cancers. So a lot of these things uh, and chronic disease, some chronic diseases can be linked to certain cancer or even colorectal cancer. And as we know that um, chronic illness, maybe such as diabetes, uh, we may see those in the minor minority communities more so. Um, but, you know, we have to offer those, those educational pieces, especially in primary care, because that's where we see those persons first and where we, we can actually get them out to the colorectal specialists or to the general surgeons. Yes, this is so true. Uh, <clears throat> you all, we, I just want to kind of stay here because this is, this is some good information, um, but I know we were talking about some preventive, preventative measures. Are there um, some different food that people can eat to try to help prevent besides the diet and exercise and helping us to um, prevent some of this uh, colorectal cancer? Yeah, you know, it's an excellent, these are excellent points that Dr. Poindexter's brought up because while we talked about colonoscopy as being a preventative um, test in many ways, um, you know, um, there are, there are many other things that we should be, we could be doing and probably should be doing when we're um, even younger than our, the typical screening age, right? Because by then, all of those exposures have happened. You know, um, Dr. Poindexter actually pointed out a, a lot of these factors. Tobacco use is clearly um, a concern and clearly associated with increasing risk. So smoking uh, cessation is a really important preventative measure. We know that the rates of colorectal cancer are twice as high in obese individuals um, than they are in normal weight um, uh, individuals. So maintaining a healthy weight is really um, important. That also comes with regular exercise. And we know that people who exercise regularly um, have a decreased risk. In fact, it's almost um, half the risk among people who have a sedentary lifestyle. And um, there are other factors. Um, it, high consumption of processed meats, a low fiber diet, you know, not having enough fresh fruits and vegetables. So you know, if, um, increasing the amount of fresh fruit and vegetable intake can also um, potentially reduce your risk. So we know that people or populations with that kind of a diet have, have a lower risk than those um, you know, who have primarily a, a meat-based diet, as an example. It's not to say that you can't go out and enjoy a nice hamburger. Uh, <laughs> But it's to say that, you know, in moderation and kind of a good balance um, is really, really um, important. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that. I, I know um, in some areas, um, minority areas, there are uh, considered food deserts. So they don't always sure. have access to, you know, those uh, fresh uh, leafy green vegetables um, that you were speaking about. But um, definitely, you're absolutely right about that. Okay, so um, one of our um, next questions is, um, does your organization have any outreach programs for patients that you guys see like that may um, get cancer? Um, do you guys kind of offer any programs for them to help them along the way? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure all of our all of our programs, our, all of our organizations have you know have such programs. But um, we have a variety. We have um, you know programs for um, uh, stool occult blood based sort of initial screening for colorectal cancer in underserved populations because exactly as Dr. Poindexter was talking about the challenges in accessing you know colonoscopy. The good news, the really good news, is that I think we are sort of right at the cusp. Probably, I'm, I'm hoping in the next 10 years, uh, we will have non-invasive tests that can detect early uh, or precursor lesions. Today, we have tests 
that can identify cancer, but they're not so great at identifying polyps. What we really need to get to is to be able to identify a polyp on a non-invasive test so that we can choose then who needs a colonoscopy, right? It's much easier to screen everybody if that screen is easier. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of a program that we have. Um, other programs are ways, once somebody is diagnosed, um, you know, they need, um, there are certain populations that benefit from navigation. And so um, we have efforts um, to help navigate patients through the system, provide transportation. Um, we actually are connected with a number of organizations that even um, fly patients across state lines to you know, help them to you know, get their treatment when they need to come here for treatment. So um, I, think, I think there are always opportunities for more of these things. They're never enough actually support, um, uh, but, uh, but these are some of them. Um, Dr. Humphreys or Dr. Uh, Poindexter, would you like to chime in on that? Or? For our patients, um, you know, once the diagnosis of uh, colon cancer, rectal cancer has been made, we also have um, multiple uh, uh, support uh, endeavors for patients, um, including multidisciplinary conferences with uh, not just surgeons and gastroenterologists, but oncologists, radi uh, radiation oncologists. Um, radi uh, radiologists, uh, so that we can de de devise a treatment plan tailored specifically for that patient and help move them through the system so that they can get the appropriate treatment uh, in a timely fashion. So, and, and, I, and I would like to say, you know, thank you to MD Anderson as well, because um, as Community Health Network, I mentioned we're a community health center that we, we serve the, the under-resourced, the underserved population. And so that was, um, uh, I will say, a measure mover for us to be able to participate in what MD Anderson offers, to be able to provide, you know, screening to our patients that cannot afford to do a colonoscopy outright. So, but the, the next step actually came where if, um, needed, you know, they were able to also receive a colonoscopy. So, you know, I think at the primary care ground level, I mean, that is, that is a, um, a really foundational move. Uh, and again, you know, we at, at a primary care level, it's, it's our responsibility to do these things, to make sure persons are screened, um, to make sure that we educate and um, we're also involved in, you mentioned food deserts earlier. We're also involved in organizations with the, the Houston Food Bank and also prescription, um, um, prescription foods for those specific things when we know people are at high risk for colorectal cancer that we can prescribe you know, healthy green vegetables or leafy vegetables and, and educate them on uh, better ways to, to help in the, in the beginning, you know, to, to prevent these things from happening because we, we have to start early. So I get the pediatricians involved. Everybody should be involved um, because this leads up, you know, to another time as we see, as we see these cancers occurring earlier on in life. And again, that's another social determinant, you know, of health where we may not uh, get the education in the household or we're not eating healthy in the household, but we can turn that around. So I think it's our responsibility, primary care there to start the education early um, and, and do the prevention or, or do the screening and again, get them to the right person. So if we, if we, if we do, get the cancer diagnosed early. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, I'm just making sure to see there's not a uh, question in the chat. Alrighty. Um, so uh, my next question is, if I am diagnosed with colorectal cancer, what should I do? Start with Dr. Chang. Um, well, um, I would say uh, the first thing is um, I'm glad that the diagnosis could be made. You know, it's um, and and the first thing to know is that um, 
you know, the, the good news about colorectal cancer is most people who are diagnosed with colorectal cancer will be diagnosed at a curable stage. So um, I think take a deep breath and, um, and just kind of, you know, um, you know while, while some people will be diagnosed with more advanced stage cancers, the vast majority are diagnosed with the stage that's, um, that can be curatively treated. And so the next step then becomes um, uh, to, uh, to make sure that, you know, you seek um, specialty care, that, you know, I try to identify um, uh, an, an expert in colorectal cancer in your, in your area or elsewhere that is able to help you and know that um, their ability to do what they need to do. Dr. Humphreys talked about involvement of a number of different providers in the process. And that's really, really important. Uh, we call that multidisciplinary care when we have a variety of different specialists, each um, specializing in their own area that come together to design treatments. Um, in order to do that, it means that we need complete information. So I think one of the things that happens, you know, it's a very frightening thing to hear, I've got colorectal cancer. And the, the next response then becomes, okay, get it out. And actually that's not what we wanna do. In fact, we don't wanna then rush into surgery. Um, colorectal cancer is not fast growing. It's actually much, much more important to have a complete workup done, complete the evaluation, get all the tests that need to be, that need to be um, you know, uh, evaluated, and then seek care uh, because, because where you seek care, how the treatment is, um, is performed actually will have a huge impact um, on your outcome. The type of tests, um, just uh, by the way, are um, include blood tests that look for a tumor marker. We call that a carcinoembryonic antigen test. Um, and um, most typically it's um, a CT scan, um, generally of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. That those are at a minimum, the tests that should be performed. Um, if you have rectal cancer versus colon cancer, then a dedicated um, uh, MRI of the rectum, it's a very specialized way. It's not just a regular MRI uh, should be performed. And then of course, you know, the surgeon um, who's evaluating the patient actually should directly evaluate the tumor. In other words, do an exam, uh, including an endoscopic exam to localize that, that uh, tumor. So those are kind of some of the, you know, very, at a, at very broadly speaking, um, some of the things that need to be done. And, um, uh, and so it's really important to make sure that each, you know, that the evaluation gets completed um, and that one doesn't rush into, a, into you know, typically surgery would be kind of that, you know, impulse to, you know, to move on to that next step. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I know that we have been talking quite a bit about uh, colorectal cancer, and we know that it is a uh, Colorectal Awareness um, Month, but Dr. Humphrey, is there any other types of cancers uh, that um, you have encountered in your practice that you would like to talk about that may um, affect the minority uh, community? Uh, sure. You know, as a general surgeon, um, my practice is not limited to colorectal cancer, and I do see other uh, cancers. Um, before coming to UTMB, I, I practiced in a larger metropolitan area, and then I, I moved to smaller rural um, communities. And so we, we would treat uh, many different types of cancers. Um, but breast cancer is a, another type of cancer that, that we see. Um, and of course, uh, there's screening exams for that, including mammography and self-breast examination, which is important. Um, and then I see other types of cancers that could involve the small intestine, uh, soft tissues such as skin cancers like melanoma um, and other uh, rare types of uh, tumors. Some of these um, cancers, are, you know, when, when we see these patients with cancer patients in Angleton, a lot of times we can deal with and take care of their cancers here, but sometimes we'll see rare or uncommon cancers and we would um, refer them to uh, specialists um, within our UTMB organization. Uh, for example, Dr. Klimberg, Dr. Chow, and Dr. Silva are, are, are breast surgeons um, uh, with UTMB. We have Dr. Tyler, who's uh, specialized in um, uh, skin and soft tissue tumors, and Dr. Perez, who is a specialist in pancreatic and hepatobiliary uh, tumors. So um, 
for me, even when I see some of these cancers that I don't necessarily uh, take manage or take care of uh, in Angleton, then um, we can get them to uh, our, our super specialist surgeons in Galveston for treatment. Very good, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Poindexter, can you um, talk a little bit about um, what we can possibly do to help improve the cancer disparity among minorities? So that's a, a, a great question. Um, we we've actually touched on a lot of a lot of that, you know, during this whole conversation. Um, so you know, we can go back to we talked about education, we talked about prevention, uh, we talked about access to care. Um, I, I mentioned also social determinants of health, how we can work there. Um, but I think you know again. There are a lot of with with minorities and 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 I'll say everyone. Everyone has some type of cultural cultural belief, and um, it it may be you know you don't want to go to the doctor. Um, a lot of times, I, I know I can say speak for the African American community. You know, for that, uh, sometimes persons are concerned that if they go to the doctor, they're going to find out something is wrong with them. So, you know, that's, that's really the whole point of going to the doctor. So those are some of the things that we, we, we really need to do is educate, help educate persons, get out there on the ground. Um, and we've really seen that, especially with the COVID, with COVID, you know, and even the vaccine that the Hispanic community and the, um, the African-American or the minority communities, I'll say, have had hesitancy and confidence in medicine, period. So I think it's our responsibility um, as, a, as a group. You know, here we are with the Missouri County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce that is um, that are, you know, helping to educate persons about colorectal cancer and other cancers uh, and minorities in cancers. So the education, that's a, a big part of it. Um, but there has to be more, um, you know, there has to be more. And, and I mentioned earlier too about access to care, uh, community health network. Uh, again, we're a primary care facility that gives that access if you're under resource or, you know, don't have the ability to pay, we'll work with you to, to uh, be able to do that. Um, and then there's also in the legislature, how do we get you know, more people involved to make sure they're funding these types of, of, of uh, healthcare organizations to help do that work when minorities don't have that access. Or, you know, um, their social determinants of health. Uh, we work with the United Way. The United Way is doing some great work on social determinants of health. Uh, if you haven't if you haven't really learned about it or you want to be um, learn some more about it, look those up because those are the things that create barriers, especially in the minority communities uh, that don't allow us uh, to get health care or get to health care. Uh, it deals with finances, education, um, uh, uh, food deserts, uh, transportation. We mentioned that earlier. There's so many different things that we need to do out there, but to hone in and start um, on the education and start at home first, I believe is just to build that foundation. If, if I can just elaborate a little bit, and um, that point about education is so key and you know, where that education can be delivered anywhere. You know, this is the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. If business owners can, you know, um, if there are opportunities within, within businesses to, to be able to promote screening or to be able to promote awareness. Um, you know, in the Hispanic population, cancer is the number one killer. It's not heart disease. And so it is a really, really important problem. And it's probably undercounted actually in the Hispanic population, right? Um, for a variety of reasons, um, including, you know, uh, concerns people have about, you know, going to, going to see a doctor, um, if there are certain, you know, aspects that that uh, about themselves that they'd like to, you know, if they're if they're concerned that there's going to be too many questions about, you know, documentation status or what have you. So 
I think business owners um, can really play a role. Um, the other groups um, include church groups. Um, if they're, if it, wherever the community happens to be, whatever, you know, wherever the, whatever is the community home for, um, for our, our patient populations, for Hispanics or, or other um, groups, you know, that is a great place. If, if the, you know, if at the church it's being promoted, like we're doing with the vaccine um, today, um, then that can help. Um, and I think one additional barrier that we see today uh, actually is COVID. There is this fear that I'm gonna get COVID if I go to the hospital. Um, know that you can very safely get testing today. You can very safely get, whether it be a colonoscopy or one of the non-invasive tests. And so the first step is obviously to go and get that test um, so, that, so that you can have early detection and potentially um, prevention. So I think those are things we can do within our community. There are other things that, um, and, and it's great to have, you know, um, groups like the, like Dr. Poindexter's group that actually provides this kind of access because there are a number of people, as I mentioned earlier, who are sort of afraid to go to the doctor. Um, but there are a number of other things we can do um, legislatively that, and, um, and support sort of legislatively, which is that, you know, stop asking people, you know, about, um, about, you know, citizenship or documentation status when they go to get healthcare, right? They shouldn't be afraid to go do that and actually provide coverage you know, for everybody. We should have healthcare coverage for everybody. There shouldn't be people who don't have insurance and, you know, um, stuff like that, I think are, are, you know, super, super important. And I would just like to add that um, uh, for me working in a smaller community, I have good relationships with the primary care providers here. So just in having discussions with them regarding um, screening, um, screening exams, not just for colon cancer, but other types of cancers, and just establishing those open lines of communication um, so that we get those patients uh, referred for um, these procedures if, if, um, if the patient's um, willing to, um, you know, undergo these uh, screening tests. So just keeping communication with our primary care providers, reminding them that we're able, we're here and we're um, able to see their patients and be willing to provide um, some sort of screening for them, I think also helps facilitate improving our abilities to screen these patients. Oh yeah, I think you guys are just absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, you, you have shared with us so many um, nuggets and just information that really help us. Um, so um, we have about 10 minutes left um, for this round table. And what I want to do is um, if there is someone on that has a question that maybe we did not um, um, ask um, any one of our panelists, please feel free to type it in the, into the chat. Um, I will um, let um, and allow two, two minutes uh, for each of our panelists to share any um, any closing remarks or just any um, other um, information you just guys want to provide to um, everyone on today. And we'll start with Dr. Chang. Um, if you have any last words that you would like to share. Sure. Well, um, I don't know if there are any questions that have come in that you'd like us to address, but you know, thanks very much to the Hispanic, uh, the Zora County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and Amber, um, you know, for leading this discussion. I think this is like one of the most important things, right? To have these discussions, to help, to try to help get the word out, to you know, bring awareness to the fact that this is an extremely common cancer. Um, you know, in Hispanics, the second most common, third most common among um, all Americans, and um, or all people in the United States. Um, and you know, recognizing that I think is you know is step one. Also, taking some of the fear away. If you're diagnosed, the vast majority of the people will be diagnosed. If if we can get diagnosed early, um, that is really the key. The vast majority of people are diagnosed at a curable stage, but the earlier, the better, the more likely that the treatments will be successful and the more likely that the cancer once treated, you know, will not come back. So I think that's super important. Um, and then the last thing I would say, um, you know, um, is you know, uh, recognize that, um, recognize that, you know, 
uh, while there may be inconveniences and concerns about doing some of these tests, it's a lot less inconvenient than being diagnosed with cancer. So go get screened, pay attention to your body, you know, talk to your doctor if you're experiencing, you know, blood in your schools or changing your bowel habits. And if you're of age, go get screened. Dr. Chang, I love you said that earlier. Uh, it's easier to go get tested than have to deal with actually having a cancer. So I actually I like that you said that. Um, Dr. Humphreys, do you have any last words that you would like to share with us? Uh, well, I would like to thank the Brazoria County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce for inviting me to this roundtable discussion. I think we had a, a really productive uh, uh, discussion today. Um, I just would like to reiterate what was already said before. Um, the go, go talk to your doctor about getting your screening tests. Um, personally, I just had my first colonoscopy a few weeks ago and you know, the bowel prep wasn't even as, as horrible as the, you know, you imagine in your head. And uh, the colonoscopy itself was the greatest nap I've had in a really long time. And uh, I agree with Dr. Uh, Chang, it's uh, much easier to deal with a, a bowel prep and a colonoscopy than it is uh, to be faced with a really a, a scary diagnosis of uh, cancer. Yep, I think you're right. Hey, now you, you're you making me want to go get one. I'm just 41, but I'm, I'm just saying with that nap part, Dr. Humphrey, I, I'm all for that. <laughs> okay, and Dr. Poindexter, do you have any uh, closing remarks that you would like to share with us? Just again, thank you for uh, getting us all together for this round table. Um, to you know, help bring awareness about colorectal cancer, especially uh, in the Hispanic um, groups, as well as other minorities and the chance to talk about other cancers. Um, I concur with what everyone said. Um, very, very important again to talk to your doctor uh, or your provider, I'll say, you know, because in, in rural communities, a lot of times we do have nurse practitioners and physician assistants, uh, and those are good providers also, but talk to them, make sure that, you know, especially if you have, or you're, it's time for you to be screened if you're 45 and above, or if you have a, a family history, a strong family history, make sure you know what your history is to get screened. Uh, we didn't talk a lot about the symptoms, uh, but um, um, it, they were named by Dr. Chang, you know, change of bowel habits or, or blood in your stool, those things we need to watch for. And just, you know, just know that um, it is not a barrier. No barrier should keep you from seeing or getting be, to get screened, you know, for any type of cancer. Um, and there are availabilities out there to do so but check with your primary care provider and um and then you know just be your own advocate and be your circle of influence their advocate as well if you've been here today you know pass the word on that screening is important <laughs> You are absolutely right, Dr. Poindexter. Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat, but we do have a lot of um, kudos and comments to say this was a great um, healthcare roundtable. So many people type that into the chat. Um, and so I will um, let attendees know if you do not have a doctor, we have three great panelists here uh, that you can look up and uh, uh, get an appointment with them. Um, and so I'll turn it over to Gina for her last remarks and comments, but I just want to personally thank each of the panelists for attending today. Um, we know time is the most important thing that you all have that you cannot get back. So we appreciate you spending time with us on today in our chamber. Gina, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chan Chang and Dr. Humphrey and Dr. Point Dexter for taking your time out to giving us a lot of the important information that our Hispanic communities and actually all of our communities need to learn about. Um, we have set up these um, healthcare roundtables specifically for, you know, just to give some you know, great information to our communities. Um, the next one that we have is going to be May 5th. That's gonna be focused on mental health. August the 4th would be uh, back to school. And then October the 6th would be breast cancer awareness um, month. So uh, really thank you guys for participating. Thank you, Amber, for being our moderator today and everybody stay safe.